in fact, forget to record. Um, luckily, we've only covered stuff that we already talked about in lab last week, and that was recorded. Um, so you're not missing out on, on that much. And better than half the classes here. So you at least have, have notes and can ask me about it if you do on uh, Tuesday, um, if you do have more questions about it. All right, and so this is what I was talking about just a second ago when it comes to making a stereo center. Um, our, these radicals wind up being more or less planar. They're not quite sp2 because you do still have one electron in that, in that last p orbital. Um, but that one electron, that partially filled section of the p orbital is more stable when it's when it's unhybridized mostly because that allows the the carbon carbons around it to donate some of that electron density. Remember we talked about how the term we used was hyperconjugation. And that's how we discussed which of the different carbocation intermediates was most stable. We said the one that's most substituted is most stable because having other R groups around it allows them to donate some electron density to partially fill that empty orbital. Um, and the free radical is somewhat similar. It's got a vacancy, even if it's not a, a not looking for an entire lone pair. Um, and so having it in that P shape allows it to get more electron do um, density donated to it. So we do see it as a planar intermediate. And we can we know this not because we can take a picture of it and see it as being planar, but because we get a mixture of R and the S product. We start with something that has stereochemistry. We lose the stereochemistry when we do this reaction. So for instance, if we started with, let me draw a molecule where we will actually be able to Mm, let's see. Uh, clear that. Hang on. I got one. So let's say we had cis dimethyl cyclohexane. If we brominate this, we're going to brominate it at the methyl groups, right? Right at the tertiary carbons. But and we're going to get a mixture of the one that has the, the methyl cis relative to each other and, and the product as the methyls trans relative to each other. We'll get a combination of, so if we said H nu Br2. We'll get roughly 50% of it is going to be this product, and 50% is going to be with the bromine up and the methyl down. All right, so we started with something that has stereochemistry, that has the cis and the trans isomer, or that has only the cis isomer. And when we go through this free radical mechanism, we get something that has both possibilities. We're not stereo selective. We're gonna get a combination of both of them. We might slightly favor this first option because the bromine is bigger than the methyl group. And so we're gonna favor the sterics, favor putting the biggest thing away from everything else. So the sterics would favor putting the bromine away from the two methyl groups, if possible. Um, but we will see both of these products show up. All right, and so that's just a reminder that just like with our addition reactions, in general, 
if there's a possibility of making an enantiomer, we're going to see both enantiomers. Um, with our addition reactions, we had to be more specific when it was a ring structure because we had the sand versus the anti-addition. This is even easier. If you're making a stereo center, you're going to get both possibilities for this one because we're only adding something to one side. So here's, here's the molecule I was trying to draw that I couldn't come up with off, on the fly. Um, another example, if you start with a stereo center and that's where you're going to brominate, you lose the, the initial configuration. Hmm, excuse me. Which again, makes things simpler rather than more complicated. You have to remember to put plus EN on a lot of these, but it, it makes it simpler to draw your products. So let's predict the major product for each of these. I'll give you a few minutes to do that.
All right. Thanks for your patience. It's first day back is hybrid for my son. So we're trying to get into. Yeah, not not real thrilled about it either, but he's had two weeks and then a week off and we'll see how how numbers look after that. So anyway, anyway. Um, let's let's predict each of let's for each of these let's circle the carbon where we're going to put the bromine or at least that's how i'll show my work um so for a i'm right here I'm the more stable or the most stable intermediate is the one that we make by pulling a hydrogen off from the tertiary carbon for b we only have the, we have a quaternary carbon, which doesn't have any hydrogens we could pull off. So we're not going to pull any carbons off here. We'll pull or we'll pull the hydrogen off from the tertiary carbon once again. C, we've got one tertiary carbon that has a hydrogen that can be abstracted. Remember, that's the, the chemical term for pulling the hydrogen off is abstracted and yet we'll look at ethyl benzene is a good example we'll look at that one after we've done done these ones on d d is a complicated one we've got a bunch of secondary carbons we've got two quaternary carbons and the quaternary carbons can't don't have a hydrogen to remove the Primary carbons are the two are the there are five methyls on this molecule. So we're not going to use any of those. The one carbon that has a hydrogen that is most stable when you pull when you abstract the hydrogen is that tertiary one on the left. All right. So our product would for A would look like. Put a bromine where the hydrogen was. And if it does that make a stereo center? Do we need to worry about R and S? Uh, both directions around that ring are identical, right? So that's why we do need to pay attention for B, because on B, both directions are around the ring are not identical. They're each going to have their own priority. So for B. We'll get a combination of R and S. We'll get both. We started with just a single enantiomer, but because it goes through that free radical mechanism, we lose that stereo configuration. And we're hey, gonna Sean? get yeah. Um, will the bromine come from behind or would they be evened out? They'll be they'll be pretty much evened out because when you pull the hydrogen off mm -hmm. to make room for the bromine it turns into that planar structure. So it goes to being flat. And once it's flat, it's got a 50-50 chance from the bromine come from top and bottom. If we wanted to be really specific, we could look at the chair configuration um, of this and see you know, which, which configuration is gonna have the most interactions with those. But with the, both of those methyls being on the same carbon, it's probably not gonna really matter because they're the sterics are going to be the same from on top and bottom because the two methyl groups are the same on top and bottom. Um, so we'll get almost almost exactly 50-50 probably with this reaction. For C, change color for the sake of clarity here. And again, we still have R and S here. And so if you, and again, if you draw the wedges and the dashes for one of them, then you would just want to put E plus EN to show that to the other one. If you draw it without showing the wedges and the dashes, you can just say 
R and S to indicate, but you do need to indicate that you know you're getting both enantiomers in one of those two ways. So for B, the other option would look like if I drew it as If I drew one enantiomer, I would then want to say plus en. If I draw it as ambiguously as to which enantiomer I am drawing, you would just want to say R and S in parentheses that you get both of them. Those would be the two, the two most common ways of showing that you get both of those options. And for D, D was quite the complicated looking molecule, right? And anything that's not reacting, we just leave it the way it is. I could show that bottom methyl group a little bit better. So anything that's not reacting stays exactly how it is. And then the carbon where we are adding our bromine, again, you could either show it ambigu ambiguously just with lines, or you could show one stereoisomer and say plus EN. Um, although this one wouldn't be it'd be a diastereomer because you'd only be flipping the stereochemistry on one of those carbons. So if you've got two stereocenters, you probably want to just draw out both of the options because plus EN gets a little bit tricky because we're only going to be flipping the stereochemistry on one of those, not on both of them. So we would get there'd be our first molecule. And again, nothing changes on the right hand side. And we're just going to flip the methyl and the bromine. All right, but just to review vocab, you guys see why they're not enantiomers, right? Because an enantiomer is a mirror image. And a mirror image would flip both of those stereocenters, not just one of them. So when there, when there are two stereocenters, this is your safest bet would be to sh just draw both of the options rather than um, doing R plus S or plus EN. Just be specific um, so that there's no possibility of being mis misunderstood. And these are my two possibilities. Even if it's more drawing, you'll save time in terms of the amount of confusion somebody else will see. We'll get out of it. Um, we see that also a lot with um, with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates like glucose frequently have two two different stereoisomers that you see in in biology. There's L glucose and D glucose, um, but they're not enantiomers of each other because glucose has like five different stereos has four different stereocenters, five different stereocenters. And only one of them flips when it switches from D to L glucose. And it has to do because it's a ring opening reaction. So you guys have all seen glucose drawn as a ring, right? Even if you couldn't draw it yourself, um, it has a way of opening that ring and then reforming the ring. And that flips one of the stereocenters when it does that, but not the others. So that's a case where because it's glucose and it's so important to biochemistry, we just specify D-glucose and L-glucose. They have their own name for it rather than saying plus an antiomer because it wouldn't be an enantiomer. The enantiomer of glucose would be, realistically, it's probably an artificial sweetener. Um, it's not going to be something that occurs in nature. It might be galactose. The other the, of the three simple sugars, the three simple sugars are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Um, the enantiomer of glucose might be galactose, but I'm not sure about that.
carbohydrate chemistry gets very confusing um, because there are so many different enantiomers and they all have the same formula. They're all C6H12O6. Um, and yet they all taste different and get used in different things and show up in different foods. Um, and when you link them differently, you get different sugars as well. So like if you take one glucose molecule and one galactose molecule and link them together, you get lactose like from milk. But if you link together two glucose molecules, you get maltose, which is the which is what gives beer a malty flavor or malted milk a malted flavor. And if you link a fructose and a and a glucose, you get sucrose, which is table sugar. And so we can actually taste the difference between all of those, even though they have identical formulas and they really look really similar too. It's just a few stereo centers difference, really. Um, and then if you take them and you make them just a little bit further away from nature, you get something that triggers your, your sense of, of sweetness way more effectively. And that's what an art, artificial sweetener is. Artificial sweeteners don't necessarily, they, at least the modern ones, don't necessarily have less calories. They're just more efficient at triggering the sweet response on your tongue. So you have to use less, use a tiny little pinch of aspartame to get the same response as three tablespoons of sugar. Your body still will digest the aspartame and get some energy out of it, but because it was just such a tiny amount that you added, it doesn't wind up adding very much in the way of calories. And that's why you see things like low carb drinks, like, you know, low carb monster energy drinks and whatnot. They still have like, they have like 10 calories in them in a whole can, as opposed to regular monster energy, which is like 400 calories in a can. Um, and that's because they're using stuff that is more efficient, even if it doesn't occur in nature, it's better at trigger triggering that taste response. All right, there was a request to do the same, um, the same process with ethyl benzene. So that was one of our, our compounds from lab. Um, and exactly what it sounds like. Ethyl benzene is benzene ring. With an ethyl attached to it. And so there are three types of hydrogens on here, right? There are the aromatic hydrogens that are attached to the benzene ring directly. They don't really, they're so hard to break off of that benzene ring. We're not going to touch those. They're not going to happen in these free radical reactions. Um, we'll have to add a whole nother class of reactions for replacing hydrogens on a benzene ring. Um, that's electrophilic addition or sub, sorry, electrophilic substitution as opposed to the nucleophilic substitution we've already done. Um, we also have a carbon right here that has, that is secondary benzylic. So these one circled in red are aromatic because they're directly attached to a benzene ring. So they're not going to react. We've got ben, a secondary benzylic, and then we have a primary aliphatic. Remember, it's aliphatic basically because once you pull that hydrogen off, there's no resonance that can happen, right? That's, there's no resonance and it's not attached to a pi system directly. So it's aliphatic. Aliphatics are lowest common denominator for these classifications. Like an, it basically means alkane, right? So the one that we're actually going to replace the hydrogen is going to be that benzylic, secondary benzylic. And if we were doing chlorination, we'd probably see a combination of the purple product and the blue part product. We probably still wouldn't see any of the red product um, because those are in a whole nother ballpark, but we'd probably see a combination of the other two possibilities. But if it's bromination, we're going to see just the one product, which is going to look like so h nu bromine
And did we make a stereo center? Yeah. We have four different things attached to that benzylic carbon. So we'd say R plus S. Right, so this isn't a case we didn't lose the initial configuration because there was no initial R versus S or cis versus trans. We still have to pay attention to did we make um, a stereo center? All right, we feeling pretty good about these. In a lot of ways, like I said, these are this is a different set of mechanism steps, but the products in a lot of ways are simpler than our addition reactions. Pull a hydrogen off, put a bromine on. Let's see what I have next and if this would be a good time to take a break or not. Um, yeah, this is a great time to take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at nine.
All right, let's start pulling back in here. And let's start talking about what happens if there is resonance. We already mentioned it a little bit in the context of benzene rings and things being benzylic. Um, and we talked about a little bit about the allylic positions. And we can actually put numbers to each of these bonds. Um, so remember I told you that the vinyl, the vanillic hydrogens had the highest bond energy. They were going to be the hardest to pull off. And that, that is, in fact, what we see, that the a secondary aliphatic hydrogen is 400 kilojoules per mole to pull that hydrogen off. It's almost, it is, it is 10% higher to pull the vanillic hydrogen off, 444 kilojoules per mole versus 400 kilojoules per mole. So what that really tells us, one, is that when we're, when we're picking which hydrogen we're going to, to remove, it's pretty much never going to be, we're never going to pull off a vanillic or aromatic hydrogen. We can basically leave those hydrogens alone because there's so much less, those, the intermediates we would make would be so much less stable. Um, but the other interesting thing here is that we can actually put a number to how much the resonance stabilizes things. These two, the out, the allylic, the allylic, oops, no, clear. That's not what I wanted. Carbon hydrogen and the secondary aliphatic should be relatively the same if not for the resonance, right? The only thing that's different about those two positions is the resonance, right? So this allows us to actually put a number to just how much more stability do we get from the resonance. It winds up being a really significant amount, right? Another 10% drop. It's um, So it's 364 kilojoules per mole to break off the hydrogen in the allylic position. It's another 40 kilojoules per mole higher to pull off just a regular secondary aliphatic. Right, so that means if we're going through a free radical mechanism, um, if we have bromine in the presence of light, it's not going to go through an addition reaction if we're careful about this, right? Because if we didn't have the light exposure, if we didn't have H nu written here, we would expect this to be a, a dibromination, right? An addition reaction where we break the pi bond and put a bromine on each side. But if we shine light on it, we actually get the free radical product. So just like with SN1 versus SN2, we could con we could control the reaction conditions to tell the reaction whether or not it was going to go through mechanism one or mechanism two, and that allowed us to control what products we made. We see the same thing with bromination. Bromination in the dark, of it, you wind up brominating the alkene doing the addition reaction. If you do this reaction in the light, you get the free radical bromination. The problem is, is that both reactions can happen if you shine light on it, right? If you shine light on it, the other reaction could still happen. We're just allowing another competing pathway. So now we have a competitive reaction as opposed to picking one or the other, which is confusing to say the least and problematic for synthesis as well. Um, because we don't want competing mechanisms. We don't want competing products. We want one product so we know exactly what we're going to get every time, as much as possible. So if we're trying to avoid competing with the alkene reaction, we need to make sure we're trying to keep it in the free radical mechanism if we actually want to see this reaction with good yield, we actually don't do it with just pure bromine. If we do it with pure bromine, we're going to get a mixture of both of these products. Um, if instead, though, we use 
a different bromine source. Instead of using bromine as a molecular bromine, <laughs> excuse me, um, instead of using molecular bromine, we actually use what's called NBS, which stands for N-bromosuccinamide. Succinamide is this molecule that is um, this ring structure with the two carbonyls and a nitrogen that's part of the ring structure. If you put a bromine on the nitrogen, that's what makes it N-bromosuccinamide. Um, and I can clarify this a little bit. It's not really that we're keeping concentration of Br2 down. But there is no concentration of Br2. We're keeping down the concentration of, let's see if I can get to the radical symbol quickly. Where are my mathematical operators? There they are. There you go. We want to keep the concentration of the bromine radical down. Um, because there is no concentration of uh, Br2, there is no Br2 in this reaction. Where we're, instead of using Br2, we're going to use NBS. And NBS, in the presence of light, will break apart to form free radicals the same way that that Br2 does. But this allows, it keeps the concentration much lower. We can do this, this is a slower reaction. And it means that we don't have the right reactants for the alkene addition to take place, right? For the alkene addition to take place, we needed Br2. This isn't Br2, therefore we're not gonna see that addition reaction happen. Um, and so it's just like that first reaction that, that I showed, we're going to brominate in the allylic position. If you have NBS in light, you don't have, you don't brominate the pi bond, you leave the pi bond where it is. And then we're going to wind up putting our bromine in on the allylic position. Though we do still have to worry about resonance. So in this case, the first product that we would draw here would look like would look like this. Pull off the allylic hydrogen and replace it with bromine. We get RNS, two identical methyls, right? So no stereochemistry there. But that intermediate that we had to make to do this, this intermediate that has the resonance that makes it so much easier to pull off the allylic hydrogen means that we're actually gonna get another resonance structure as well, right? What is the other resonance structure gonna look like? And move that pi bond over, right? So we'd wind up as far as drawing, I switched the colors here from normal, but we wind up with moving the pi bond over and then we wind up with our free radical being on the primary allylic that's the resulting. So we'd get Do you imagine that being a, a free radical dot instead of some sort of satanic symbol? Um so that means that our two products that we're going to get here are going to be, okay, well, if we brominate the first free radical position, and then we also have to look at brominating the, the resonance structure. So that would look like
something like this. I know resonance has been a while back now, and you probably didn't have a great handle on it to begin with because it is one of the trickier concepts from first quarter. But we are going to get a mixture of both of these possibilities. Which of them is going to be more favored, the red or the black? The I should brush up on my sign language, and then you guys could all sign R or B. I think the red. The red. Why? Uh, just because I would imagine it's more stable. Yeah, they're both. They both are allylic. Both of the we're, what we're going to look at here is which of the resonant structures is more stable to determine what it's. And it's not like it's really sh switching back and forth between those two, but we can kind of treat it that way. Like, okay, well, if it has these two possibilities and it's both of them simultaneously, it's going to look mostly like the one that's more stable. And putting the free radical on the tertiary carbon that has resonance is more stable than the primary carbon that has resonance. So the red one will in fact be the favored product, our major product would be, be this one, because that resonance structure is more stable. The resonance structure that leads to the red product is more stable. We will see some of the other one observed, um, but it would be the minor product. And if I had to guess off the top of my head, it's probably going to be like a 10 to 1 ratio. 90, 91% 90, of it is going to be the red product, and 10% maybe is going to be the black product. Sean, I got a question. Mm -hmm. So then with NBS, um, unlike the other one where the bromine to the primary carbon, we were going to get 0%. This one, you will actually get a little bit of it with the NBS. Right, because it's not the, the hydrogen abstraction already happened. 100% we're going to pull the hydrogen off of the tertiary carbon, off the allylic position, what started as the allylic position. But once we make the intermediate, then it can, it can resonate back and forth between the two possibilities. So it, it's absolutely right to be paying attention to that. But the bromine, the bromine doesn't have to be selective between these two possibilities. The bromine's going to pull off the same hydrogen every time. It's just what's left over then the free radical that's made has two possibilities for what it can be. Really, really good question. Good clarification. My cat's trying to chew on my stylus while I'm drawing with it. Cats. All right, let's do some practice. And for some of these, no reaction is a possibility. If there's more than one product that you're going to have a significant amount of, draw all of those products. All right, I'm going to use Moleview just to give me a um, blank space to write on on this slide. Um, 
So but I'm going to go down the left side first. If it's just BR2 plus light, there's no pi bond to worry about. So no resonance, no allylic position. Everything's aliphatic. We're just finding the most likely hydrogen to remove, pulling it off, replacing it with the bromine. And then technically, again, o, o chemists get lazy with their balancing. All of these would be plus HBr or plus HCl as the, the side product. We just usually forget to write that because that's usually not what we care the most about in organic chemistry. That's just going to be something that we're going to clean off in our purification steps, usually. So for A, we would wind up with putting the bromine on the tertiary carbon. Do we get an R or an S? No, nope, because we have two identical methyls. So just one product. If we look at C, there are three possible places we can chlorinate, right? We could get one chloropentane, two chloropentane, and three chloropentane. Technically four, because the two chloropentane will make an R and an S. And so we could put the chlorine. And in the interest of saving space, I'm, I'm just going to indicate where we would attach the chlorine for each of them. One chloropentane and three chloropentane have two identical substituents, two hydrogens on the one chloropentane and two ethyls on the three chloropentane. So no stereochemistry there, but two chloropentane is going to have be R plus S. And again, if you missed that last section, that's that's the the last point out of ten. Nine out of ten would be getting the three big ones. If you forgot to put put R and S for, for two chloropentane, that's minus a point, not that big a deal. Um, the way that I like to phrase it is enough that if you don't consider plus an antimer ever, that you're going to feel it on your test score, but not enough that if you miss it once in a while, it's going to drop you from an A to a B. All right, so be watching for it, but don't beat yourself up if you miss it now and again. E is our new reaction we just added, NBS in light. Look at the allylic position. This is actually the same exact one I think we just did, right? Except flipped over. I think it's drawn backwards. So we're going to get two products. We're going to get Bromine on the tertiary product, that's going to be our major product. And then our less prominent but still measurable product would be resonating that pi bond over and putting the bromine on the primary on the opposite side from the methyl. Which, and we could even. We could even name these. We haven't done any nomenclature in a while. What would be the name for the major product here? Just for the sake of practice. Base molecule is going to be one butene, right? And then on carbon three, you have a methyl. And you also have a bromo on that same one. So three methyl, three bromo.
three methyl, that's supposed to be a three. But my, there we go. Three methyl, three bromo, one butene. Any sister trans to worry about? Two hydrogens on the on the one carbon, right? So we couldn't tell the difference if we mixed them. And even the other isomer. Oops. The bottom isomer still wouldn't have sister trans because you can't tell the difference between those two methyls on the left hand side. Right. And so the only thing that would be different about the bottom one, it was it would be three methyl, one bromo, three, two butene. Right. Your numbers would change, but all the substituents are the same. How about the other side here? First one looks a little weird. We haven't seen iodine used very much. Anybody remember why that was? Too reactive? The opposite. You're close. Fluorine is too reactive. Bro or iodine was not reactive enough. So we this would be a classic case of no reaction. If we gave it a long enough time, maybe we would see some of it. But typically, if you want to put an iodine on something, on an alkane, you brominate it first, and then you do a substitution reaction with the, brom with the brominated version, and you replace the bromine with an iodine that way, um, just because it's less reactive this way. It's, it's faster and better yields to do two reactions than it is to wait long enough for the iodine to do this on its own. So for D, we didn't talk about NBS plus benzene, but is there any difference about it? It's It's got resonance. It's got a benzylic position instead of a, instead of a um, allylic position. You see what I'm dealing with here? It's kind of entertaining, but she should probably go off. Um, so if it's benzylic, the same same thing applies. It's again simpler because we're not going to break up the benzene ring. We have resonance to stabilize the benzylic position, but we're not going to put a bromine anywhere on the benzene ring because that would break up the benzene. Right, so for D, we're only gonna get one product. Which is also what we were expecting with the with the toluene with toluene when it came to just adding bromine to it from our lab, right? Um, we didn't need to specify there. We didn't have any competing process. We didn't have the addition reaction, so we didn't need to use NBS. We could use just regular bromine because it was benzylic. We didn't have any pi bonds other than the, the benzene ring itself. So we didn't need to worry about the competing addition reaction. Then last but not least, if it's an alkane, that's our simple case. Find your most stable intermediate, put the bromine there. Casey? Sean, I was gonna ask, how come we can't do a resonance form and put the uh, bromine on the um, ring itself? So you can draw the resonance structures and the resonance structures are going to look like what we would expect. I'm gonna clear the product here and draw up the resonance structures, some of them anyway. So the intermediate here would look like 
would look like that, right? We pulled a hydrogen off from the benzylic carbon. The resonance structure, though, is going to look like, so we're going to move one of these over, one of those over, and that's going to put our, oops, let's see, to keep my pi bonds in the same spot here. And then we would have a pi bond out of the ring. So in theory, it seems like you should be able to brominate this, right? But the problem is if you brominate it like this, then that puts an sp3 carbon in the benzene ring. We added something, an extra sigma bond to the benzene carbon, to the aromatic carbon, which means it's no longer a benzene ring. So the resonance structures can happen to stabilize things, but we're never going to break the benzene ring by actually adding directly to any of those resonance structures. Um, and so that's, and, and we will see that repeatedly when it comes to resonance, we will see reactions happen that look like they might break the benzene ring up, but if they do actually happen, they immediately either then happen backwards to remake the benzene ring, or they wind up rearranging in some way to remake the benzene ring. Because the benzene ring itself is so stable that we're basically not gonna do anything to disrupt it for longer than, than a second, even when we get into the electrophilic addition. Um, this actually looks kind of like the, one of the intermediates that you make as an electrophilic addition. You wind up adding, an electrophile to a benzene ring for a second, and it breaks the benzene ring for a second, but then the benzene ring immediately kicks a hydrogen off and remakes the benzene ring. So it still winds up staying like that. So the, your, your rule of thumb should be like, even if we can draw a resonance structure, your product is still gonna have the benzene ring in it. I think there's maybe two reactions in the entire year of OCHEM that'll actually break a benzene ring, and that's because you're making some other form of an aromatic reaction. Um, which is also why, if, if anybody's ever um, tried to burn styrofoam before, it's a terrible idea for the environment, but back in the 90s when I was young and dumb um, and had less knowledge, um, if you ever try to burn styrofoam, it doesn't burn, right? You get, like it, it'll burn kind of more like it melts and then you get this really black sooty smoke. Um, that's the, that is the uncombusted benzene ring that's poly, part of polystyrene. Styrofoam is a big long carbon chain that alternates where you put a benzene ring every other carbon. Um, and that benzene ring won't burn even though the carbon backbone does. And so that black sooty smoke is the benzene ring itself, basically in some sort of free radical form that might look a lot like this, which is why it smells so bad and you know, probably, not probably, very carcinogenic, very bad for you to actually, if you can smell burning styrofoam, um, then you can like start crossing days off your life expectancy, essentially. Um, really bad for you. So don't do that, really bad for the environment as well. And when it comes to these products, it just means that we're always gonna keep our benzene ring. Unless I very specifically call it out as, hey, this is one of those two reactions. Um, just always assume you're still gonna have your benzene ring. All right, for F, nothing tricky no alkenes, no resonance. So we're just looking at where's the hydrogen I can pull off, which is on that tertiary carbon on the left, right? So we'll wind up making that product. Any R or S, any stereochemistry to worry about? Two identical methyl groups, right? That should be what, probably your first thing on your, not your first thing on your checklist. One of your, the things you look though, look for those, can I find two identical substituents on the active carbon? 
if you can find two identical substituents, boom, don't need to worry about enantiomers. All right, so we have one more reaction to add. Uh, that's the one we just did. And there's some more practice there. Um, we'll come back to that if we have time here in, in a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about one more reaction that's slightly different if we can force it to go through free radical mechanism. So if we had an alkene and we put it plus Br2, our first thought should be dibromination, add a bromine to each side. Um, but we found that when we exposed it to light, it behaved differently and we got a radical mechanism. We're going to see something similar with HBr. With hydrobromic acid, normally we would expect it's acid catalyzed hydration. You protonate the alkene, then you add the bromide to the other side. So you get the Markovnikov acid catalyzed addition. Um, this is actually one of the first free radical mechanisms they actually figured out because they realized if they used old alkenes, if the alkenes had been sitting on the shelf for a long time, they actually got the anti-Markovnikov product mixed in with the Markovnikov product. And the fact that since the acid catalyzed addition was a really well understood mechanism, there started the there shouldn't be, we should not be seeing any anti-Markovnikov, right? This is the, the classic Markovnikov reaction is acid catalyzed bromination. So the fact that they were seeing any of it said that there had to be a competing mechanism, right? And when they say impure reagents, sometimes it was buying cheap stuff, but more commonly, and we'll talk about why in a, in a few minutes, it was stuff that had been sitting on the shelf a long time. Um, old reactants predominantly, they wound up decomposing and re going through another reaction when they were exposed to oxygen repeatedly. If you wound up opening the jar, taking some out, closing the jar again, or if you just didn't have a good sealing lid on the top, we take for granted these days in the days of, um, of cheap cast plastics, being able to seal something and have it be airtight. When they were making these lids out of tin in the 1800s, that wasn't always a given that you could actually close a jar and have it stay airtight. Um, what, we, what they actually saw was this anti-Markovnikov addition. Then somebody went through and started looking at, well, how can I favor the anti-Markovnikov addition? Instead of getting two competing reactions from the same substituents, how can I favor making anti-Markovnikov? And what they found was, and this is the one that showed up in chapter eight, the way you do the anti-Markovnikov additions, you had to have a peroxide there. If you have a peroxide there, you can actually favor making the anti-Markovnikov addition at a 20 to one, basically. So just the same reaction, just with a different catalyst, essentially, allowed it to go a completely different mechanism. Right, and I'll put this, the, this back on the board in a second, but I want to look at the process. Um, and it turns out that it, it has to do with if you put a peroxide and you expose it to heat, that peroxide bond is even weaker than a bromine, bromine, bromine bond. So the bromine bromine bond and chlorine bonds, you needed light to split them apart to start this. Peroxides, all you need is heat. If you just have heat there, that's enough energy to get them to split apart into free radicals. Um, and it is uphill in energy, but not by that much. Plus 151 kilojoules um, is not that much compared to the hydrogen abstraction process. And if you expose one of those, one of those oxygen or those peroxide radicals um, to HBr, you end up making the bromine radical. And now all of a sudden you've got something that's going to go a totally different way because you don't have something where you can protonate your alkene anymore. You don't have an acid anymore. You have a radical instead. And what that radical is going to do 
is either it's either going to pull a hydrogen off of the allylic position, as we've already seen, but there's also the possibility of it attacking the pi bond itself. And so if we have the pi bond itself being attacked, we wind up making a free radical when the bromine attacks the pi bond. And that free radical, this is, it's basically reversing the steps of the acid catalyzed bromination. For the acid catalyzed addition, we protonated and then the bromide came in. Here, because we make it a free radical, the bromine comes in first. And so then to make your more stable intermediate, your more stable intermediate puts the, the radical on the more substituted carbon, which then has to go out and find something else to fill it. And so it's going to do, once you initiate the reaction by exposing it to the peroxide, um, it'll keep the reaction going by going finding another HBr molecule and grabbing the hydrogen off of it and leaving the bromine radical. Right, so it, it really is like the just is flipping the steps because because it's going a radical mechanism compared to the acid catalyzed steps where you add the hydrogen first. And then you're going to wind up, this is not a particularly um, good reaction when it comes to, it's going to make a lot of different possibilities because there's a lot of different possible ways you can make these radicals. Um, you, you're going to wind up with some of it. Sometimes you're going to wind up with the dibromination product. Some of, some of the time you're going to wind up um, with the two carbon radicals reacting with each other. Um, but the most stable processes are the ones that lead to the anti-Markovnikov product. Right? And so that's why we get such a good yield. That other 5% is not just the Markovnikov product. The other 5% out of this net, out of the 100% down here is a mixture of all sorts of random crap um, that we would need to then purify, get rid of it somehow, do some recrystallization or um, do it some solvent extraction, something to get rid of any bromine gas that, or bromine liquid that we made to get rid of the random polymers that we allowed to form from stuff like the, the radicals reacting with each other in weird termination steps. Um, it's just a mess of other things that are happening in there. But the one that's most stable and therefore the one we make the most of is that anti-Markovnikov addition. But that's a little bit weird considering we we just talked about if we have an alkene, if we expose it to NBS in light, we add it in the allylic position. But if we expose it to HBr in peroxides, we add, we do the, the alkene addition, but we get the anti-Markovnikov product. And if we expose it to just HBr with no peroxides, we get the Markovnikov product. So just like with our hydration reactions, we could pick the hydration reaction for an alkene to get one of three different possibilities, right? We've got similar things here where if we can control the conditions, we can choose which of these mechanisms winds up being um, favored. And the, the biggest deal winds up being the concentration of your reactants. If you have a low concentration of bromine, then that means that, that your free radical intermediate has to stick around for a long time, right? Because the, it has to bump into a bunch of different things before it happens to bump into a bromine and could actually brominate that or find the hydrogen that it can pull off to make the product. So if you keep your concentrations low, you're going to favor making the most stable intermediate because it has to stick around longer. And the most stable intermediate is the one that has the resonance. So when we use NBS, 
NBS, we specifically used NBS to keep concentrations low, right? And that's what allows it to go through that resonance structure instead of just breaking the pi bond. If you're not using NBS, you're going to wind up doing one of two different addition reactions. So low concentrations favor making the most stable radical intermediate, and that's the one that has resonance. High concentrations are going to favor making the addition reaction because things are just going to happen faster. So they don't need to have the super stable intermediate. You're going to, to make the addition product because that's where all the electrons are. And so if you have lots of electrons around, they're going to get attacked by these free radicals if you have lots of the free radicals around. So by keeping the concentrations low and keeping the reaction going slow, we make the allylic substitution. If we let the concentration get higher by using different reactants, then we're going to make the addition product. Right, and realistically, that's what these different reactants being shown this way, that's what they're showing. So if it says NBS, that's specific, that is O-chemist's way of saying really low concentration of bromide radicals. Therefore, go allylic. If it says just add HBr, that's, so that's going to be pretty high concentrations, like one to one stoichiometric ratio. Therefore, you're doing addition reaction. Right. It's a it's a little bit like when you're if you're using idioms in in English that, you know, any native English speaker knows what, um, you know, don't let one bad apple spoil the whole barrel. But you know what that means, even though we're not really literally talking about apples. Right. This is sort of like chemist idioms. Like I'm not saying with a really low concentration of bromide, but I'm I'm implying it by saying NBS. So why did they see this with specifically with um, old reactants and impure reactants? It turns out it's because it, it turns out oxygen itself is a pretty nasty compound. We need, we think of oxygen as being really like favorable to breathe because you know, that's what keeps us from dying. Um, but it's also a very reactive molecule. That's why oxidation happens. That's why metal rusts. And that's why lots of different plastics start degrading over time or losing their favorable properties. And that's also why you wind up with um, things like different dried herbs lose their, their herbiness, lose their, their scent after a long enough period of time, especially if they're already ground. You've got something with a lot of surface area. If you've ever um, you know, we did cloves in uh, Gen Chem, right? We did the, the experiment where we extracted clove oil from ground cloves, and I made you grind the cloves yourself, right? In a mortar and pestle. Because if you buy ground cloves, they'll only smell like cloves for maybe a month or two on your shelf. Um, if you buy the ones that are, aren't ground, that are the whole cloves, they, they have a lot less surface area, and so there's less a contact with oxygen. Because when you expose these, especially unsaturated hydrocarbons that have some resonance that can happen, you wind up making with this auto oxidation happening, especially if they get hot. Anything that has a benzene ring basically will wind up with auto oxidation happening if you expose it to both oxygen and heat. And it doesn't have to be a lot of heat, like just your garage um, is enough, uh, enough heat that you can wind up with this auto oxidation happening. And you'll notice that the product of it is a peroxide. So these old reagents that they were using that were impure and they didn't know why their products were changing over the course of six months when they were using things from the same jar, 
they would start with everything being pure Markovnikov product. And then as they continue to do their experiments, they would get more and more of the anti-Markovnikov product. And, and it was basically, not basically, it was literally your reagent going bad, being exposed to oxygen and being oxidized. Um, and that affects smell and taste as well, because if it's not the same molecule, it's not going to trigger the same receptors in your mouth or in your nose. Um, and so a lot of aromatic compounds, aromatic in the in the uh, cooking sense, in the culinary sense, um, a lot of things that smell fragrant, if you let them be exposed to oxygen, it's not just that those fragrant compounds are evaporating, that's some of it but it's also that they're just plain out going bad and reacting with the oxygen. And we can actually look at the mechanism for this one too. And so all of these, what they all have in common, all of these free radical mechanisms, they're really all the same mechanism just about, just they might have some resonance involved, but it's always gonna be an initiation step where you make free radical, and then some propagation steps and you write the propagation steps. Remember, write the propagation steps in a way that um, that add up to your net reaction. And I actually would, I think it would be better. I don't like that propagation step. I would write it as the radical plus O2 with the double bond. That's how oxygen normally looks, right? So when you have oxygen gas, you can break one of the, the pi bond between the two oxygens, and that leaves a radical on the other side. So to me, that the one that the way it was drawn before just was missing an arrow because it had it drawn as as um as though oxygen gas was already a free radical, and that's not really accurate. Oxygen gas has a pi bond between the two oxygens that you would be breaking to do this. But it looks really similar to what they have drawn, right? And either way, the product The product is another is a peroxide that's also a free radical that's then going to go find another hydrogen. And so a little bit of initiator at the beginning, it, you have to have some sort of initiator usually. And sometimes oxygen can be that initiator, but also depending on what impurities are present initially in your, you know, if you've got a, a pure compound that's 99.9% .9 pure, that 0.1% that's not the compound you care about can be the, the initiator sometimes. It's something left over from the synthesis process or from the extraction process. It's something else that's reactive. So we don't necessarily know what the initiator is all the time. And it can just be oxygen gas. Um, it's less likely to be oxygen gas because we don't usually see oxygen get gas decomposing into hydrogen peroxide spontaneously. Right, but if you do have any other source of a free radical in there, this is also why you don't see spices. Really, nice spices are not stored in plastic because the cheap plastic that you make that you make things for for food consumption, it's good enough for food consumption, but there's trace amounts of free radicals in it. You guys have all, you know, that's one of the reasons why free radicals became such a buzzword in nutrition is, you know. Oh, don't don't freeze water in your Nalgene because it releases free radicals from the plastic. That can be the initiator. If you just have plastic that is exposed to heat, that can release enough free radicals to start this process and make your, your stuff go bad faster. Glass doesn't typically do that. Glass is just more stable than most plastics at, at uh, relatively at reasonable temperatures. And then once again, the, the termination step can be any number of things. Um, the propagation step steps are the ones that I'm looking for the most. Any termination step, you can draw a termination step, any that's any two radicals 
from the from the propagation or initiation that are bumping into each other as a termination step. You have to draw all three of these classes. But what I'm looking for the most is, did you get the right initiation step? Because that's what starts the whole thing. And do your propagation steps add up to your overall reaction? In other words, whatever you make in your first propagation step should be used up in your second propagation step. And you wind up with something that just looks like and then anything that gets remade in your second propagation step cancels out your radical from the first one. So what you're left with here is O2 plus your R molecule goes to the peroxide form. All right, so that's what I mean by they have to add up to your overall reaction. When you cancel out anything that's made in the first propagation step or used in the first propagation step, it should add up to your net reaction. All right, and then again, I'm not really looking closely at what you draw for your termination step. It just has to be any two radicals bumping into each other is a valid termination step. Any two radicals that were already as part of the reaction. So just find something and it can bump into itself or it can bump into something else, whatever, it doesn't matter. And once again, I've gone slightly over, um, we will tackle this word problem on Tuesday at the beginning of class. It's kind of a, a good one to, to look at the possibilities and try and work backward for it. So I'd encourage you to look at it before class on Tuesday. I'm not gonna make this your quiz because I'm gonna make your quiz um, write some practice writing these mechanisms, probably to write, write these mechanism problems. Um, so you can practice drawing initiation, propagation, termination. Um, and again, that will be posted later this afternoon. I'll, pro I'll probably post that and then get on grading your stuff from last week so that you can get some feedback on those too. And then as soon as I get that done, I'll post the key from last week. So I give you guys a lot to do over the weekend, but then I give myself lots to do on Thursdays, especially. So. All right, everybody have a good weekend. I do have office hours at 1030. If you need anything from me, um, feel free to jump in there and uh, and ask questions. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Have a good weekend, guys. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.